Today on the Stingray Show, we are going to actually talk with a coach who coached under Bob Toledo at UCLA and also helped develop Cade McNown and, of course, Jason Campbell right down the road at Auburn. That and a whole lot more coming up on this edition of the Stingray Show right here on Tide 100.9. The dogs and Stingray are coming for you! <laughs> this is Stephen Ray, aka Stingray, coming to you live from Tuscaloosa, Alabama. I'm Heath Hopkins. I'm here in DeSoto County, Mississippi, right outside of Memphis, Tennessee. I don't know if you want me to get mad. I don't know if you want me to get mean. I don't know if you want me to get rowdy. But that's what I'm about to do. First defense. We are Mississippi State! Fear the Bills! How many chicken wings you eat in a city? And you just look, ballpark it. Four. What? Four chicken wings, my Here we go, guys. Dobbs, back to pass. Launching the ball! Jared, he's got it! Jared, he's got it! Touchdown, Tennessee! They shot the dogs in Sanford Stadium! Are you kidding me? My God Almighty! What an epic way for the Tennessee-Georgia rivalry to end this game! What a play! Wow! And Heath, any final thoughts before we sign off here on the Tide 100.9? It is great to be on with all the great folks in Tuscaloosa. And hey... If you don't like it, you better learn to love it because this is going to be the best show going today, baby. And with that, we are welcoming you to another edition of the Stingray Show. And let me go on ahead and say hello to my co-host, Heath Hopkins. And Heath, just like you said in the open, sir... Where is it that you can only find former offensive coordinators and amazing stories like the one we're going to give to you today right here only on the Stingray Show? You don't like it, you better learn to love it. Hey, <clears throat> today's show is going to be absolutely phenomenal. It, the stories that are being told, the just the insight of college football, what's going on now, what used to go on, but just the stories and the quality of the interviews that we have today, you can't find yes. it anywhere else. And it's absolutely phenomenal. And, you know, honestly, our guest is actually writing a book that will come out in August that he, repres that he uh, represents and talks about a lot in the upcoming interview. But also, he was a part of history in that 1982 Stanford and Cal game. Yeah, that really took me back. You know, I grew up a Broncos fan. I'm a huge John Elway fan. And, and it was absolutely, you know, John Elway still, he gets very bitter and upset talking about that Stanford-Cal game. That was his senior year, and that game kept John Elway from going to his one and only chance at a bowl game. Uh, that crazy play that happened when the band comes out on the field. And our guest was there, and you know it, yes. it was absolutely phenomenal to hear all the stories he talks about. And, and, and not only that, our guest is absolutely hilarious, charismatic, over the top, but just a funny guy. Well, Heath, it's that time of the show again. Time to bring on our very special guest. And what are your thoughts on our guest today? You know, I'm looking forward to this. He coached one player that came out of Mississippi. Uh, I heard him share a story one time uh, about our next guest, and I'm looking forward to asking him a question about it. But I've always been a fan wherever he went, and I've enjoyed watching his offenses, and I've just enjoyed watching his team. So I can't wait till we start our next interview and bringing in our guest. Absolutely. Would you like to do the honors, sir? No, sir. You do it yourself. Okay. All right. Our next guest was a coach at California. He was also at Boise State, Oregon, UCLA, Indiana, Cal, Oregon, San Diego State, Michigan, San Jose State, Auburn, 
and most recently at UT San Antonio, ladies and gentlemen, the one and only Al Borges. Coach, how are you doing, sir? I'm doing great. It took up half the program to tell you where the hell I've been. <laughs> well, coach. Holy smoke, you guys don't have enough time to go over my resume. We got to get into the real stuff here. Yes. <laughs> but it's great to be on. It's great to talk to you all. And, uh, you know, I've been retired for a few years. So uh, anytime I get a chance to talk about football and anybody's even half interested in what I say, I get excited. Right. Well, Coach, I want to go on ahead and start off the top. You said that you are writing a book that is out in August. Tell us a little bit about that, please, sir. Yeah, I, I did have it. Written. I've actually done with the book, okay? okay. All right. Uh, I'm going to tell you, it's an interesting deal. A book was never on my radar, right. okay? I, did, I had no intentions of writing any books. I'm, I was going to leave that for, you know, Ernest Hemingway and Dan Grisham yeah. and all those guys. But I went back to Auburn this wow. last uh, last year. My son, who's 17 years old, is looking at colleges, and he wants to go to Auburn. Right. And I said, well, what better experience than to have him go back for the Iron Bowl? Yes. So I had been doing a uh, weekly YouTube on Michigan football, mm -hmm. an hour-long show where we deep dive into the schemes and do telestrations and all the, all that good stuff. But I said, I am going to forego going to the Michigan State-Michigan game, which I'd gone to all the home games. Or not the Michigan State, the Ohio State-Michigan game. Right. And uh, I'm going to take my son to to, uh, to Auburn. He says, what better experience than to go to the Iron Bowl, right? I figured, heck. Right. Oh, yeah. He was only three years old when we lived in Auburn, so he doesn't really remember it. But it right. kind of rubbed off on him. And he's an Auburn nut. I mean, he knows he knows more about Auburn football than Philip Marshall, and that's saying something. <laughs> but uh, I took him there, and we went to the game, and it was a great game. The wrong team won, but uh, it was really a good game and a great experience. I got a chance to see all a lot of the guys I coached back then. But more than that, I got a chance to see a lot of the fans who never forgot the 2004 season. It's like it happened yesterday. I mean, this is like 18 years ago. I'm going, these people, it's like it happened yesterday. So when I got home... Uh, there were two things that stood out to me. One was that my kid had kind of solidified that he wanted to go to Auburn. But number two was that I needed to to send a memory some way or shape or form. So I said, you know what? I'm going to write a book. Now, I had written a book back in 2000, but it was a, a book on quarterback play. It was a how-to mm -hmm. book where coaches only buy those books. You weren't going right. to sell off any of them. But I said, this is going to be a, a book about not about that. And a matter of fact, it's, it's going to be a book with, where football is the theme. But it's really not as much about football as it is about. <laughs> like our show. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's like the synergy, the majestic synergy of a team. Yes. That's what it was. It was. And because they did, we didn't win the national championship, or we can argue one way or the other, they're not. But mm -hmm. uh, that made it all the more compelling. Is uh, So I got to thinking, okay, I'm going to write this book. But I'm not going to. I talk 95% about the team. Right. The chemistry, the whole thing. But there's a five, ah, five to 10 percent, I'll say, that works outside that box. And, it, you know, because it's written 18 years after the fact. Right. Mm -hmm. I coached at Michigan. I coached at UTSA. I coached at San Jose State. I've been other places. So uh, in retrospect, you can kind of compare and analyze what that experience was like before mm -hmm. you went there. And after you went there, so it was an interesting perspective. And I didn't want to make it so football oriented that a, a woman wouldn't pick it up. You know, if you put a right. bunch of X's and O's in there, they're just not going to read those kinds of books. But right. I, so I, I said, I'm going to make this so that anybody can read this book and enjoy it, including Alabama fans. I have a, a spot. I talk about Alabama fans, you know, and talk about my experience at Michigan a little bit, comparing Denard Robinson to how I coached. Uh, Jason Campbell. I mean, I went into a lot of really good stories that haven't been told. Some stories in this book that don't come out in the other publications because several people have done things on this season, but this is nothing like that. This is yeah. in the huddle. This is on the sideline. This is in the locker room, and this is in our meeting rooms. This is staff rooms, offensive rooms. There's some things in there that you know, some stuff I hesitated a little bit to write. I said, but no, nah, you know, I'm going to write it. I, I don't. It's not a tell-all, but it I is like honest. It. 
there's some things yeah. in there that, you know, that, uh, that aren't all warm and fuzzy all the time, you know? So, but I didn't want to, I didn't want to indict it, especially it was with such a great season. There's no reason to talk about all the bad things because there weren't a lot of bad things, but there is ebb and flow to every season. When, even though you, when you win every game, there's ebb and flow things that went on when I got there and you guys can relate to this being Southerners, my adjustment yeah. Southern, not just football, but Southern thinking, Southern everything. You know, wow. I, I talk about that. I, I you know, I'm not going to talk a lot about, it, but it's in the book. But one thing I did want to allude to it is one thing that it brought me back to. Have you both? Have you guys seen my cousin Vinny? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I am Vinny Gambini. Okay. I came in. I didn't talk right. I didn't eat right. I didn't do anything like anybody in Alabama did. So I had to. You know, make these adjustments. And to be honest with you, when I got hired, I was like Vincent Gambini. I walked into the courtroom and the judge looked at me and said, who the hell is this guy now? Okay. No. I didn't dress right. You know, I wore Hawaiian shirts. They all thought I was a moron and they might have been right. But uh, I had an adjustment that went with the coaching that went beyond the X's and O's. Talking to the kids and having them all address me as yes, sir. I mean, I'm not used to that. You know, it was it's just wow. different. You know, it was really different and, but it was, it was cool because I'm a bit of a chameleon anyway, and I have a way of adjusting to situations, but the South is a long way from Salinas, California, which is where oh, I'm yeah. from. Oh, I'm yeah. More ways than just miles, you know? <clears throat> so, uh, Coach, you, <clears throat> you've already kind of touched on it. I grew up in Mississippi. Uh, Taylorsville is a high school program that's well-respected all over the state and it's not a big high school. It's one of the smaller high schools in the smallest divisions and football here in Mississippi. Jason Campbell came from Taylorsville, Mississippi. You coached him. You went on to the Redskins. <clears throat> but I heard a story. First practice, you give Jason the play. He goes to the huddle. He calls the play, and you stop everything. He's like, there's no talking Mississippi in my huddle. And that made me laugh. I just laughed and laughed and laughed. But what was it going in? As you kind of mentioned, uh, being new to the South and everything and, and having a quarterback from Mississippi, uh, what was that situation like? Do you remember that day at practice? Oh, do I remember? <laughs> <laughs> it took me two months to understand a word the kid said. Okay. <laughs> uh, he spoke with a Southern accent and in a low murmur, okay, if that makes any sense. Okay? Yes. Oh, yeah. So, uh, and he didn't talk a lot. He didn't say much, but he took it all in now. He had, he had run a lot of offenses, and that, was that for me, was kind of a plus because there wasn't anything that you could show him that he hadn't – he didn't kind of understand. You know, he had worked with some good coaches. But my issue uh, – and I talk about this a little bit in the book. I remember when I first got here, I, uh, I talked to him on the phone. I called him up, and I talked to him probably about 10 minutes – and I got off the phone and I looked at my wife. I said, I didn't understand a word that kid said. <laughs> I didn't. Didn't understand one thing he said. And, and then I got to thinking about it. I said, you know what? I'm going to do most of the talking anyway. I'll, we'll get this figured out. And the day you're talking about, we had called, I think, a boss play, which was a, a, a stretch play off the outside where the safety goes and, or the fullback goes, kicks out the safety. We, it's an outside zone play, Okay without going into all the details of it. But um, he goes, no, he goes, I write 38 balls. And I said, what did you just say? He goes, I said, coach, I said, I write 38 balls. I said, I don't understand what you're saying. He says, <laughs> and then I got to thinking about it. And I said, you know what? It really doesn't matter that I don't understand what he said. As long as they understand what he said. And they, you know, they have probably, you know, they're used to listening to him talk all the time. And the way he talked. But it just didn't sound, it sounded so different to me, you know. And and, and I got to I, I got to stop and think, you know, uh, where I am, you know. This is not this is not the Midwest or South. They right. talk a certain way, and you got to learn how to adjust to that. Okay, I said, and I mentioned this in the book. I said when you move to the South, it's not a matter of uh, when in Rome do as the Romans do. No, in the South, when in Rome. You become an Italian, okay? It goes <laughs> beyond doing what the Romans do. They, they, there's an expectation, and that's that's the culture. That's what you have to adapt to. So uh, 
And when you're coaching, you're coaching 95% Southern kids. So right. that's, that's, you know, it's a challenge for a guy like me, but uh, I loved it. And you know why I loved it? Because they loved football. They Absolutely. were nuts about football. It was a different, you know, I, you know, I coach kids that love football. Don't get me wrong, but this was a different climate. This was a different landscape. This was a place where it was a 24 seven proposition. Yeah. Uh, they grew up in that with that mindset and they weren't hard to coach. Wow. Well, let's go back to your first coaching stop in uh, Division One. Let's go to your time at UCLA, and especially under Coach Bob Toledo. Talk about that for just a little bit, your experience at UCLA. Well, when I was at UCLA, I, my first experience was actually with Mike Bellotti at Oregon. I, would have, okay. I was at Oregon one year. Okay. And I left for UCLA because I wanted to coach in the NFL. I thought – Coaching at UCLA, they had produced a lot of NFL coaches. Right. And I left Oregon, and part of me is glad I did it because I think it was a great – we had a great five years there. But another part of me said, you know, if I wanted to be a head coach, Mike Bellotti had produced Jeff Tedford and Dirk Cutter. And, you know, Mike says it to this day. He told me the other day, he says, Al, if you'd have stayed at Oregon, you'd have been a head coach. Well, maybe that wasn't my destiny. I don't know. Right. But I came to UCLA, and uh, we had – really good teams for two of the five years I were there. We were as good an offensive team as there was in the country. Mm -hmm. We came an eyelash away from playing for the national championship. We lost to uh, Miami in the hurricane. They call it the hurricane bowl. Cause we played it after the season. We were supposed to play right. early and reschedule it. Mm -hmm. If we beat Miami, we play for the national championship. I think against Tennessee or Florida state. I can't remember, but uh, we got beat. We scored 40 something odd points. We just didn't, play very well on the other side of the ball that day and 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 uh, we got beat and it was disappointing but uh I had a great experience there right. it was fantastic I mean I uh, I don't never regret going to UCLA I think it was a great move right. uh, it ran its course there was a point where I decided I needed to move on but the five years I was there were phenomenal and right. particularly offensive we and had a quick, quick follow-up to that Talk about Cade McNown and how you ultimately turned uh, him into a first-round draft pick. Well, you know what's funny about that is a lot of people think what we did with Jason Campbell was the greatest turnaround. I heard you say, oh, you did a great job. I've never seen you. No. The best turnaround in my coaching life was Cade McNown because Cade, my first year at UCLA – was last in the big Pac-10 in passing efficiency, dead mm -hmm. last. The next year, he was first in the country in passing efficiency. And our team went from a 5-6 and six team to a 10-1 and one team. Right. And mm -hmm. largely because of Kate. He was a highly competitive player. Kate McNown, uh, who, for those of you who can remember that far back, yeah. was a mini Tim Tebow. Mm -hmm. he, very similar to Tim. He wasn't as big as Tim, but he threw the ball with a long action, just like Tim. He ran the ball, improvised, did great things. He was not a, a spread offense quarterback, but he could have been one. He could have been one. But he ran our offense to a T. He learned quickly, was a great playmaker. Uh, just a really, for the three years I was there, uh, you know, Heisman Trophy finalist. He was a hell of a player and very coachable and, you know, Cade was one of those kids, you better tell him right, because if you tell him wrong, he's going to do exactly what you tell him, you know? You right. gotta, so it's like a computer, garbage in, garbage out. You got to make sure what you're telling him was accurate, because he was going to do his best to do exactly what you told him. Coach, you were talking about coaching at UCLA, and, and we've talked about Jason Campbell already. You know, Jason's been on our show, and he told this great story that I said, Jason, you know, in D.C., did you, you know, or during your NFL playing days, did you ever come across anybody that you were kind of in awe of or starstruck? He said, yeah, I was at a charity event, and he said the president was there. And he said, you know, and I wasn't going to bother President Obama. And, and he said, but he came up to me, and he said, hey, you guys are turning it around this year. And he said, you've been looking good, Jason. He was like, holy crap, the president knows my name. And, and he was, he said that was my uh, in awe moment. And, and, and so it was mm -hmm. one of those things. So. You know, you coached at all these great places, <clears throat> had legendary players, legendary coaches. You coached in Los Angeles 
Was there ever a moment where you ran into somebody or a celebrity or a coach or whoever that it was like, wow, here's here's somebody? Was there an awe moment for you? Well, I don't know about awe moments because when I was younger, you know, that was a big deal to me, right. running into a celebrity or somebody. But when I got older, and particularly coaching at UCLA, you run into those kinds of people a lot, you know. They're at your games. They're, you know, it's, it's just right. one of those kind of places, you know. So I didn't – I wasn't really uh, – in awe of anybody in particular, there's really only two guys that I was a little starstruck by. And one was uh, Willie Mays. When oh, I yeah. Was, yeah, because I was, you know, I'm still to this day a big baseball nut. And Bill Walsh, when I first met Bill Walsh, you know, I, I was, because I'd studied Bill, but I never met him until later on in my career. And I thought he was uh, pretty incredible. Um, but, my time at UCLA, I saw more movie stars than you can count. You know, they were in our locker room a lot of time, you know. I, right. So it wasn't uh, – it was neat to meet some guys and all that, but I never was really, you know, I'd say hi, and then I'd tell my mom, hey, I met James Kahn, you know. But, <laughs> uh, she thought it was great. I thought it was okay, but it wasn't something that, you know, that right. would stay with me the rest of my life. I was more in awe of, of, of coaches and, you know, athletes and things that from my youth – that were big to me, you know, more than the present, you know, the thing about coaching guys is you get in this vacuum, you know, and you're a little bit, and I talk about this in my book is you're kind of oblivious to some of the stuff, mm -hmm. you know, that's happening around you and you can have, well, if you read the book, you, there's a couple stories that are really good where we had celebrities. I ran into celebrities and didn't even know who the hell they were. You know, <laughs> I remember hearing a story about Don Shula. I didn't put this in the book, but I heard Don Shula met Don Johnson. Remember the guy from uh, Miami Vice? Yeah. And uh, I heard a story about how he he uh, had met Don Johnson. The guy said, hey, this is Don Johnson from Miami Vice. And Shula's response was, hey, I'm really excited. You guys are doing a great job. Thinking that Don Johnson was actually with Miami Vice. Uh, and that, <laughs> that, that, is a, that is a story that epitomizes coaches you know um that's great nick saban once turned the president down to eat lunch or something when he was at miami i i mean <laughs> that doesn't surprise me you know because these just they're there you prioritize different things and you yes. get tunnel vision well coach real quick uh we got to take a very short break and when we come back we are going to continue our interview with al borges on the other side of the break you're listening to the stingray show right here on tide 100.9 Welcome back into the Stingray Show right here on Tide 100.9. And we are being joined by uh, Coach Al Borges. And Coach, I've got to ask you this because you worked down at Auburn with Tommy Tuberville. How surprised are you that he is currently in politics <laughs> and not still a coach? Well, that doesn't surprise me at all now. <laughs> <laughs> no, that, that's easy to digest right there. That doesn't. Right. That doesn't surprise me at all. And, and Tommy and I were on uh, uh, different ends of the spectrum politically. And we yes. used to talk. Now, we used to talk about politics when it wasn't toxic. You know how it is. Right. Right. Is, of course. But we talked, you know, uh, mostly friendly banner. But oh, yeah. uh, I told him, I love you and I love coaching here. But I'll, if you ever, I ever told him back there, I said, if you ever ran for office, I would not vote for you. I just want you to know that. <laughs> So, well, uh, Coach, I'll, I'll ask you this. I, I, yeah, I thought it, it was hilarious. It, it was good. It really was. It was a good atmosphere. It wasn't a bad right. deal at all, you know. So, Coach, I sorry to interrupt there. Um, no, I thought it was funny. I can't remember who put it on Twitter, but I thought it was absolutely hilarious. It goes, Tommy Tuberville gets sworn into Senate. And the national defense uh, immediately fails, and, and, and you know Congress gets stormed. I thought it was absolutely hilarious talking about everything <laughs> that, that happened in Washington uh, with Tommy Tuberville. That is, yeah. uh, but with that being said, <clears throat> what are some of the? When was the first time you ever thought Tommy Tuberville could be a politician? They like this guy would be good at, at politics. Well, he's he's a natural now. I mean, he <laughs> Tommy knows how he wanted our football team perceived. And he did not get blindsided by the press. He was always pretty much prepared for anything they throw at him, you know. And uh, he, he, I could see him easily making that transition. It was right. just a matter of learning 
politics. That's the big thing. It's not, it wasn't what it took to get the job as much as it was once you got it. Now, right. you know, you got you to gotta legislate, you got things you got to do, and you got to know the, all the issues and everything. But uh, in terms of the process of getting to that point, uh, he was he was built for it to me, you know. I'll, I'll put you, I'll put the spotlight on you. Who's another coach that would be great at politics? I'd be a great politician. <laughs> Let's do it. <laughs> well, I would not be a great politician in the state of Alabama, okay? <laughs> <laughs> but if you put me in the right state, I, I'd be just fine. No, I, I'm kidding when I say that. I, I don't know that I'd ever be a good politician, but uh, I don't know. Nick would not be a good politician. Uh, although he's a great football coach, I don't think he's politically oriented. Um, God, that's a good question. I don't know. I have to think about that one. Maybe Lou Holtz, you know? I don't know. Oh, yeah. What? Yeah, I'd, I'd never oh. vote for him either. But <laughs> he might make a pretty good politician. I don't know. You know, I, I love Lou Holtz. I've read Lou's books. Uh, I absolutely love Lou. Do you have any fun Lou Holtz stories that you could share with us? I, you know, I never had many associations with Lou, uh, I got pissed off at him uh, because of something that happened at Michigan when he went on his Dr. Lou show and said what a bad call I made on fourth down. Uh, but I didn't, I didn't know him at all. Not really, you know, so mm -hmm. I can't, uh, but I'll tell you what, he good football coach. He really, he did a great job pretty much anywhere it was, you know, he, he had, he had that to him and you got to give him credit there. But again, he's uh He's on the other side of the philosophical spectrum from me, you know, yes. but that's nothing wrong with that. I don't have anybody, you know, I'm a Democrat, but I tell guys if I, if I didn't have, if I got rid of all my Republican friends, I'd have no friends because <laughs> <laughs> all my friends are Republicans. So, <clears throat> you know, uh, another name that always pops up on our show that always comes with a funny story. It usually happens on the golf course, Steve Spurrier. Yeah. Oh, Ronnie, is there fun stories about Steve? No, no, that, that Steve. I know Steve, but I know Steve all the way back to the USFL. Back oh yeah, the, the bandits. Years. Oh yeah, with the bandits. Yeah, I used to steal plays from them. I still ran a few of them. <laughs> but I talk about. I better. I talk about one of them in the book. A book, a play I stole from Steve that we ran against Ole Miss. Yeah. Uh, what was it? What was the play? What was the situation? Well, it was what we were trying to do is get Ronnie Brown. Uh, on a wheel route out of the backfield off a fake reverse. Now, mm -hmm. Steve had run this play with the uh, Tampa Bay Bandits. I don't know if you guys remember. Uh, Heath, you might. You're kind of old. Um, <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> well, you can, you're not as old as I am, so you feel good about that. But they had a guy named Gary Anderson, went to Arkansas. I don't know if yeah. You remember. Really good athlete, man. And uh, I looked at some stuff Gary did because I thought it fit Ronnie. You know, I thought we could use Ronnie in the in the same capacity they used Gary. And uh, they had a little play where they'd line up in slot formation and fake a reverse to get everybody to play the reverse and then slip uh, Gary up the sideline on a wheel route. And uh, we ran it against Ole Miss, and they didn't bite it, but they left Cadillac Williams wide open on a check down, and he caught the ball and ran 52 yards. So <laughs> the play worked. It just didn't work exactly the way I'd uh, I'd uh, – I had planned it. I remember with Steve. <laughs> this is a great. This is just coming to me. This is strange, but I was at UCLA, and we Bob Toledo and I used to walk up Bel Air Canyon every day to get exercise. We'd walk up right next to uh, Bel Air Country Club, mm -hmm. and when we'd walk up, guys would hit bad shots off into the street, and we Bob would always run and get the golf ball. <laughs> I mean, he used to collect more golf balls. Bob Bob never paid for a golf ball in his life, man. I'm not sure what Bob, not sure what Bob did pay for, boy. I think about it. But uh, he went and shagged a golf ball after a guy hit one out of bounds. And the guy came to get it. He saw us pick it up. And he goes, hey, can I get that ball? Can I get that ball? And Bob goes, oh, God, I got to give this up. You know who it was? Spurrier. Spurrier. <laughs> he goes, it's Spurrier. And he goes, oh, that's Toledo. He goes, he goes, I need to get my ball back. I hit that out of bounds. I, I said, what? <laughs> so we, we gave it to Spurrier. And then uh, I remember we played South Carolina uh, my third year in uh, South Carolina. And we held the ball the entire third quarter. 
They didn't touch the ball once. We had a 17-play drive. Wow. Tommy called a surprise onside kick, so we got the ball right back and went on another, I don't know what it was, 17-play drive. They didn't touch the ball once in the third quarter. You want to see a pissed-off cowboy. If there's ever a guy gets madder about not having the ball, it's Spurrier. He was standing there tapping his toe on the sideline because they could not get the ball because we were just running the ball, you know, running on him and wiping time off the clock. And, oh, was it – yeah, I, I remember talking to him. We played him in the uh, the Outback Bowl when I was at Michigan. Oh, I remember that, Al. I remember that game. God, God, we could get the ball from you. That's you know how he talks. He's, but uh, I still remember that like it was yesterday. And then they they came in the fourth quarter. They started running empty formation at us, and they were trying. They were getting back in the game, and, and the game was over. I go stay. I go Steve. Steve, good game. He goes, yeah, you're going to get empty, out. You're going to see empty formation every 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 game. Every I said, yeah, well, I don't worry about that, Steve. I'm on offense, okay? So, <laughs> so Coach, I'll go on. No, but that, that's the last time I saw Steve, I think, was uh, the 2012-2012 Outback Bowl. I have a great story. I, uh, I was so proud of myself in 2012 because – uh, I had coached against uh, Nick Saban twice uh, and beat him both times. He was at LSU once and at Alabama the other time. I was coached against Urban Meyer twice and beat him both times, once in Auburn, once in Florida. And I had coached against Steve Spurrier twice and beat him once in Auburn and once in South Carolina. 6-0, not lost to three legends, okay? So, you know – what you do is what you do when that happens, you shut up. You don't say one word because as soon as you say something, what's going to happen, right? You're going to lose. You're, well, lose. In 2012, we played Alabama the first game of the season at Michigan, and they beat the tar out of us, okay? Well, that one went down the drain. And then later on in the season, we played Ohio State with Urban. Mm-hmm. They beat us by a touchdown, so that one went down the drain. And then we played Spurrier in the Outback Bowl, and they beat us on a bomb at the end of the game. So I went from never losing to three straight losses in one season. Okay. So, so much for beating your chest about beating those guys out. That ended fast. So <laughs> I should have retired right there. And just, I told, uh, I told when, when I went back as an analyst with Gus uh, in 17, I told Gus, I said, you know, Gus, I, I've never lost to Alabama. You know, I, we played them. I beat them. We beat them one time when I was at, uh, UCLA uh, in 2000, and then uh, we beat him all four years I was here. And he says, gee, many Christmas, Al, they ought to erect a statue to you. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Go, so, oh, oh, go on. No, it was, that was, these things are all popping into my mind as I talk to you, but I think some of these I put in the book, I can't remember anymore, but uh, yeah, that's, that was, that was something else, you know. And we end up beating Alabama that year. The year I was an, an analyst. As an analyst, we beat them. Uh, and I think they won the national championship. So, mm-hmm. Wow. Which I'm wow. sure they'd have given that game up to win the national championship. Although I'm not 100% sure of that. Right. <laughs> you, that's the one thing about being at Auburn that, was, that I could always sleep at night, knowing that I could go 365 days and not have to listen to Alabama fans. You know what I mean? Ooh, I can't. Would, oh, you're still going to listen to Alabama fans. That's yeah, I was about to say. Yeah, that's ridiculous. What would they say, Coach? What would you hear from Alabama fans? Well, they if Alabama fans are, were at that time. Now that's now, now they're you know they're on a high horse now. They're different. I'm not. Oh yeah. Anymore, so I don't have to listen to them. But uh, back then, it was either they, they would much rather complain about who the head, their head coach was than talk about Auburn at the time. There was a lot of. <laughs> You know, they that was more the, the tenor at the time. And then they got Nick. And Nick, their first year, Nick wasn't great. But no, who is their first year? Not very right. Uh, but they became a Nick Saban team, and the rest is history. But uh, the one thing about Alabama fans, it was it's a little different. Because I've been in some serious rivalries now. You know, I've been in this Michigan-Ohio State deal, and it's that's a pretty big deal, you know. Oh, yeah. And then I went down there, but uh, – in Alabama, the rivalry is 24-7. Oh, yeah. You can turn the radio on in the middle of May, okay, when 
nobody's really talking a hell of a lot about football, but they are. Yeah, you know, absolutely. Turn it on absolutely. in February, and they're talking about football. I mean, it's it's a twenty four seven proposition, and the thing I admired about the Alabama fans is they don't care. I mean, they're they're bonkers now. They're nuts, right? I mean, they're off their rocker <laughs> half the time, but they don't care. They said, you don't like it? Tough crap. We're, we're, we're Alabama. And, you know, there's part of me really admires that. You know, a lot of guys would say, ah, oh, screw them. I never really was. I said that, you know what, I'd love to have fans like that. And we did. We had that at Auburn, you know. But uh, it was that part of me uh, really thought was pretty cool. Is they Yeah, they, they beat their team up when they weren't winning. Right. There was nothing going to keep them from being an Alabama fan. I mean, right. they could lose every game, and they were going to be in Alabama. That was, that wasn't going away. So, right. they did. They did not turn on Alabama. They turned on the coach a couple of times, right. but they never turned on Alabama. So you gotta, you gotta admire that a little bit, you know. Right. I've got a follow up to that, Coach. You talked about the rivalry between Michigan and Ohio State, and an Alabama Auburn. In your opinion. Which one is nastier, in your opinion? Well, that's in the book. That's okay. in the book. Okay, I, I, I talk about that. So I don't want to elaborate too much on that. Okay. But I will say this. During the week, there's no discernible difference. They're nuts. They hate each other. I mean, they, 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 Woody Hayes wouldn't get gas in Michigan when he recruited. That's there. right. I'm leaving the state before I, I'm not donating one, you know. So the that disdain is pretty... It's in the off season, right? Where it's different. It's when when the recruiting and all that, and it's still pretty vicious both ways. But I'll let you read the book. And uh, but I talk about all the rivalries I was in. I would talk right. about the UCLA USC, where they're only fourteen miles apart, guys. I mean, they're right. really close. And then uh, the uh, um, Stanford Cal rivalry, where when I first started college football, I was young kid and we lateral the ball ran through the band i was coaching at cal then oh wow uh, really oh yeah when ja john elway was that's old yeah right. elway you kept john elway from his one and only ball game he, he, yes. he's very vocal that's right. about that that's right i was there then so wow i talk about the civil war you know yeah. the oregon oregon state oregon, oregon state so it, you know i i i segue to a lot of stuff in this book it, it's about 2004 but there's a lot more oh, yeah. in there than just to pull the reader in that isn't necessarily an Auburn fan. Because right. there's two things I wanted to get to when I wrote the book. I wanted to get to the female reading base, and I wanted to get to people other than Auburn fans. Right. You know, because uh, Auburn fans, the net, they're going to read the book, the people that are really into it. They're, they're just right. out of curiosity. Like I say, the book could suck, and they're going to pick the book up just to find out, you know. Mm -hmm. But I wanted to get to to everybody I hope it, I hope it hits that way. That's that's a way. You know, it ain't going to be no New York Times bestseller, but I do want some of the people, you know, oh, yeah. that aren't necessarily Auburn fans to to use it for something other than a, a coaster or, or door wedge. You know. Oh yeah. So. <laughs> Coach, you were talking about all the great uh, places that you've been coaching. Let me ask you this: What was your favorite stop in your career, right? wherever it was? What was your favorite stop, or a few of your favorite stops, and why? Well, geez, I coached at some fabulous places. Uh, Auburn left the most lasting impression, I will say. Wow. That. And because, because of the 04 season. But beyond that, we won 41 games in four years. Mm -hmm. right? A lot I mean, of games. Yeah, I mean, they, they hadn't done that before I got there. I don't know if they've done that since. I haven't looked. But 41 games, it went beyond just that one season. But that season was so special, you just can't. I coached at Boise State. We had an incredible season my second year there. We lost the national championship game with a team that had only won three games a year before that. That was a hell of a deal. Mm -hmm. And then UCLA uh, won 20 games in a row. You know, we came an eyelash away from playing for the national championship there. Michigan, you know, when you play in front of 100-something thousand fans every single week, and I mean, you just can't, you know, there's no way to – Say enough about that. I mean, those right. people, they're, they're fantastic. I love coaching in Michigan. But because of our 04 season, I'd have to say Auburn probably had the let, the, the last impression and, and the obsession with the game, you know, right. around it. You know, I, again, I talk about some of that in the books and stories that epitomize uh, 
Alabama people in general and have their their feeling about football. So, you know, I was in my element. I I I I'm a football junkie. I still am a football junkie to a degree, but I found a place that was as crazy as me, which was yeah. kind of cool. Heath, do you have a follow-up? <clears throat> no, well, I, I had another question I wanted to ask okay. you. Coach, of all the guys you've coached with, who's the absolute funniest guy you've ever worked with? The fun, that's a hell of a – well, <laughs> you talk, you talk about any coach? Any coach. Oh, Dan Farino is the funniest guy I ever worked with. Dan Farino was our <laughs> – he was – Dan Farino worked with me at Michigan, San Jose State, and and uh, and San Diego State. He was our special teams coach. And I told him that he was on the staff, not because he could coach, but just for comic relief. <laughs> when you needed – when you needed a giggle, that's why he was on. And he was the guy I told him, because him and I are about the same age and we go at each other pretty good. And I used to tell him that uh, you're the litmus test for me. If you can figure out what I'm trying to teach here, then I know the players can figure out because you're just, you know, <laughs> you are the, uh, I, I coach to the lowest possible amoeba. Okay. And Dan, I, I used to tell Dan that you're the lowest possible. If you can figure this out, then it's not too complicated. I can coach anybody. <laughs> yes. Yeah, Dan Farino is definitely the funniest guy that I ever worked with. He just, uh, I don't know, he kept you. And I still talk to him all the time because he's a San Francisco Giants fan and so am I. So we just talked yesterday trying to, you know, figure out the lineup for this year. So Tell us a funny story about Dan. Oh, God. What are your favorites? Well, I kind of think now for a second. He used to impersonate a whirling dervish. Uh, and he told me one time, oh, this was a great story. He said, uh, he went, he's a little guy, but he's fast when he played. So he got a, a tryout with Broncos. Okay. Okay. And, uh, he said, he told the story about when he got into camp and he went against Cornell green. I don't know if you remember Cornell green. I don't Cornell green was a defensive back, uh, 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 by the Cowboys, very good player. But was uh, the Cowboys used to take a lot of projected players, and Cornell was a basketball player who turned out to be a great football player. Mm -hmm. And he said the first time I ever seen real bump and run coverage was against Cornell Green. He says I tried to get off the ball, and he put his hand on my helmet, and I was going <laughs> like, <laughs> he had his hand on my helmet, and I was waving my arms like like uh, the Three Stooges uh, Curly. Yeah, you know, he couldn't get off the line of scrimmage, and Cornell was just holding his helmet. Man, and he goes, he goes, I got cut the next day. He goes, I knew <laughs> that, that was pretty much the end of my career. So, oh yeah, he had some, he had some good ones. Yeah, he told me when he got, when he was at San Francisco State, they played a, a prison team one time. <laughs> yeah, they played a prison team. I think in a scrimmage. I think it was San Quentin. Wow. Oh, it's true. And and he said when they walked in, all the prison guys were what looking at him, you know? When he walked <laughs> in, and one guy looked at him, he says, I breaks legs. He, him. <laughs> <laughs> he goes, You think they scared the hell out of us or what? He goes, he goes I breaks legs. <laughs> That's hilarious. That's like a scene out of necessary roughness. Oh God. Yeah. Dan Dan is is a, a comedy. It's all you know, you could do a day in his life and do a movie you could do a comedy on dan but <laughs> uh yeah he's he leaves the lasting impression in my in my uh funny bone right well we got to take a very short break once again right here on the stingray show on tide 100.9 and when we come back we are going to finish up the interview with coach borges dad and a whole lot more on the other side of the break, you're listening to the Stingray Show right here on Tide 100.9. And we're back here on the Stingray Show talking with Coach Borges. And, Coach, I've got to ask you, talk about your time with Brady Hoke, both at San Diego State and at Michigan. Well, Brady was a lot like Tub because he, uh, he let you run with it, you know. He was a defensive guy. Right. So, uh you uh, you kind of got, you know, he had full autonomy. You know what I mean? He'd let you do whatever you wanted to do. And Brady was a, uh, 
an interesting cross section of two different people. Okay, Brady yes. was uh, learned his football growing up. Uh, his dad had coached with Woody Hayes. Oh wow! But funny, but Brady was from Dayton, but he was a big Michigan fan as a kid. He wanted to be the guy that wasn't pulling for Ohio State. That was his deal. Okay, I don't. And uh, when I first saw Brady coach or talk to the team, it was so interesting because he's you know very straight up, but funny a little right. bit like Dan. So, and I used to say, how would you, uh, in, how would you encapsulate Brady Hokey Hoke's personality? And I used to say, he's a cross between Bo Schembechler and Jackie Gleason because he kind of had a little of both of those to him. You know what I mean? Yeah. He, he could be funny when he had to be funny. The players loved it. But then he, when he had to turn the knob up, he was very capable of that too. Highly organized, you know. Uh, he was one of those guys that didn't want the press to think he was all that smart, but he was really smart. You know, dumb like a fox type of guy. You know, right? Uh, he tell, oh, I, I don't get that into it. I don't. Really, but well, he, he knew everything that was going on. There was never <laughs> any question about that. But he was, he was great to work for. You know, as was Tuberville. They were both. You know, they, they didn't crash in in your meetings and start telling you how screwed up the last game game plan was or there wasn't any of that we just right. you know with a with me i, I just work better when it, you're not micromanaged right. you know when they just let you run and then you know if you fail you fail but at least you're doing it unfettered right. and uh with brady with tommy with those guys you, they they pretty much let you do what you needed to do or what you felt you had to do you know and your creative juices could flow they didn't so I oh, don't do that. No, don't do that. You know, uh, you pretty much could uh, do what you wanted to do. So I, I really, really appreciated that. Well, I've got a follow up to that. And I've got to honestly say the game that I'm about to talk about and ask you about is arguably one of the best endings I have ever seen. It was the first night game at Michigan Stadium at the Big House. Y'all welcomed in Notre Dame. And the last drive to Nard Robinson completely went off. And y'all came back and won that game. Please walk us through that entire last drive of that fantastic finish. Well, uh... God, I remember it like it was yesterday, and this is good because I don't. I didn't talk about this in my book, okay. uh, my my Michigan book. I'll talk about this. Right. Yes. But uh, we uh, Notre Dame had just hit a little vertical route with uh, thirty seconds left. Mm -hmm. Okay, and I was I learned at a, a very early age of coaching that you need to have a plan for every situation. Right. Okay. Even the situations that seem the most dire, you know what I mean? You need a plan, even if it doesn't look good, you know, you got, we had to drive the ball 80 yards in 30 seconds. Now, what are the odds of that? Not very right, good. Right. And Notre Dame was probably feeling pretty good about themselves and I would have been too, but we had what we call our last three plays. Okay. Our last three plays were designed to take the ball down the field in a big hurry. There were no check downs involved. Okay. So right. every ball was going down the field. The ball had to be thrown, not to where we're going to get it intercepted, but it's going to be the good guy or nobody. You know what I mean? So we threw uh, – the first play, we threw what we call a, a two-jet flood, which is a three-by-one formation where we – we two guys run deep, one to the post, one runs a go route, and then a inside guy runs a corner pattern, okay? Right. And we're either going to throw that corner pattern or we're going to throw the ball where only the good guy can get it because there's not going to be anybody to check the ball down because we don't have that – we're not afforded that luxury with that little time. Well, the guy was wide open, and Denard missed him. Yeah, he missed him. He threw it over. I think it was. I think it was Jeremy Gallon, the guy that caught the next pass, and uh, it was incomplete. So now we're at about twenty three seconds. Uh, twenty three seconds. I think we got one timeout. Our second play was a call we a play we called uh, uh, two jet dagger wheel. Now dagger wheel is a is again that same three by one formation kind of hail mary type look, you know, right. where we run one guy to the post and we ran 
another guy on a deep break in, and then we wheel Jeremy Gallon up the sideline. Okay. Mm -hmm. And the quarterback tries to take a big bite with that dig. And if he doesn't like the dig, he throws the ball to the wheel. Again, we're only the good guy can get it because there's nobody to check the ball down to. Right. And what Donar did in his own inimitable way, stepped up in the pocket and because they're so scared of him running, you know, because he, right. you know, he runs really fast. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and they kind of came off coverage and let Gallon free on the sideline. And he kind of spit it to him on the run. And nobody was covering him. They all squeezed to the inside to cover the dig and left Jeremy on the sideline. He caught it and then cut back. Hell, I thought he was going to score for a minute. Right. But Gallon, it was a great receiver, but wasn't real fast. I mean, he, he's a 4'6", you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So he took it all the way across the field and got the ball down. I think like that, I don't know, was it the 10 or 11-yard line, something right. like that. They knocked him out of bounds, okay? Well, I didn't know this at the time, but I've watched it on the – it's an ESPN classic, so oh, you know, yeah. it's not about every other day, you know, you – Pick it up, uh, and then but and Herb Street on the telecast was saying, Well, now all they got to do is position the ball and kick a field goal and tie the game and go to overtime, which probably was a logical thing to do. But whoever said I was logical, I'm not. <laughs> so I said, The hell with it, let's take a shot while we can. Okay, so we went to uh, uh, what we call a razor route, which is a post with a a scissor type route, okay? The mm -hmm. slot formation, the guy breaks the post, guy breaks the corner, and we put a guy in the flat. Now, in that one, we actually did have a check down because we were inside the 20-yard line now. Right. We could check it down, get out of bounds, still kick a field goal. So it was no longer a last three-play situation. It was actually a red zone play, right? A modified okay. red zone play that we would run any time during the game. Well, uh, Denard was supposed to be in shotgun and went under center, and I don't know why, because half the stuff Denard did, I never knew why. But... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but he went under, he went under center. He put guy in motion, which was right. And all our plays that we run from shotgun, we can run under center. So it wasn't a big deal. But he dropped back and threw the ball behind Roy Roundtree because he was supposed to run a corner out. And in a perfect world, he would catch the ball over his outside shoulder, right? Well, it was thrown a little behind him, but it was thrown in a, in a place where he could make a play on it. And Roy turned back to the inside and got interfered with. And they threw a flag. <laughs> which scared the hell out of me because when it went down, I go, oh, no, you know, because he caught it right, for a touchdown. And, and I saw the flag down. I go, oh, my God, that we, we got all the way down there. We would, mm. Please don't let make this a penalty on us. And thank God it wasn't. He caught the ball. We kicked the extra point, and we drove the ball 80 yards in 30 seconds. But uh, And I'm not trying to take credit for it because it wasn't me. It was those guys making some plays. But we right. had a plan for You know, I remember Fred Jackson, our running back coach, came told me after the game, he goes, Al, you knew just what to do. I go, Freddie, we practice this every Friday. I mean, they should know what to do, whether it's going to work or not. I don't know, but we have a plan for that situation. Uh, right. And they executed the plan and they knew what to do. And, and you know, it, was, it wasn't, I can't say it happened exactly the way I thought it was going to happen because right. there was some deals in there that, you know, was athletic plays, but uh, well, it did work the way we wanted it to work. And, and, and right. we won the game, and and believe me, that was that was a deal. Now, oh yeah, I mean, they didn't have a they didn't have a golf cart to take us around. Right. Back to, and we're all the way in this, and I had to walk down through the stands, and it was melee. I mean, it was just insanity, <laughs> right? Because of the way that game ended. So, but it was a great great experience, particularly my first year, and you know, right. it being the first game under the lights and. You know, there were so many, so many fans there. And you know what it was? I, I, I equated it to an SEC-type atmosphere. Oh, yeah. You know, they had the pom-poms going and, you know, the all the oh, yeah. chops up in the stands uh, screaming and <laughs> hollering. And it was, you know, uh, uh, very – reminded me a, a lot of, of the SEC, which is, right. is kind of that way every week, you know. So, Coach, was that finish the most exciting finish you ever had as a coach? Probably, yeah. That have to. Anything else would just tie that. <laughs> we had, I mean, we had a couple games similar. We had one where we kicked a field goal to tie the game, where we had to do it with no timeouts. Right. And the guy Drew Dillio came running in there and slid in just in time. He had run a this gets Northwest, and he had run a route down in the end zone, and he was our holder, but we mm -hmm. didn't have a timeout. He had to sprint back to hold for the field goal. 
we ran the field goal team on because we didn't have any timeouts. And he got there just in time and just like he was sliding into second base. He slid into hold and put his hands up, and he snapped the ball a fraction before the clock hit zero. He wow. kicked the tying wow. field goal. We ended up winning the game late. So that, you know, it the game didn't have the magnitude of the Notre right. Dame game, you know, the, right. but it was every bit as, as dramatic, you know. Yes. So. Wow. Wow. Coach, I was going to ask you, uh, I know the coaching fraternity is kind of tight knit. Do you know Mike Leach or do you have any Mike Leach oh, yeah, stories? Sure. Yeah, yeah. I knew Mike when Mike was a slap. He, uh, Mike was, uh, he had not coached, you know. And right. uh, Lyle Settensich, who worked for Mike at Texas Tech, was the head coach at Cal Poly. And <clears throat> Lyle tells a great story about when Mike showed up because he wanted to be a, a walk-on coach. He, you know, Mike had a law degree. He, you know, he he didn't. I don't think he had coached some little league baseball or something. I don't know what he'd done, but he'd never done much coaching. But he said he knocked on his door and he says, uh, uh, "Do you need a?" volunteer coach and <laughs> this is lyle talking not me but he looked at mike and i know if you look at mike he just doesn't strike you as right football coach and he goes he goes yeah i could use a coach you know one you know do you know anybody wants he <laughs> says <laughs> well i'd like to and i remember lyle telling me kind of looked at him funny he goes well i need help so you go out throw the ball receivers a little bit until i'm ready to work with him you know he didn't he wasn't really counting on him Right, being an ingenious coach, he just was going to count on him as kind of just being a helping hand more than anything else. But he tells that story; it's just hilarious. The Mike, you know, Mike became Mike, but uh, that was his in, inaugural inauguration to coaching football was with Lyle at Cal Poly. I, I think yes. he'd tell you that. I, I don't think I don't think he'd ever coach football, but he might have. I don't remember. Right. But Lyle didn't think he had, you know, and yes. so. Well, Coach. We, well, one know. quick follow-up, Steve. Okay, okay. Uh, we've had a lot of reporters on the show uh, talk about Coach Leach, and they said, you know, we're trying to interview him, and he starts interviewing us, and then it just goes off the rails, and we talk about a thousand different things. Yeah. Uh, any random conversations that you ever had with Mike, like where in the world is this going, and how in the world did we get here? Well, <laughs> Every conversation with Mike's like that. I mean, <laughs> I remember I, re I read his book. Uh, I still have it. I can't remember the name. It was something about a sword. Wing your remember. sword. Yeah. And it was interesting. I found it interesting. So I called him. I say, Mike, I just read your book. It's a pretty good book. He says, yeah, I wrote that. I just, uh, you know, Mike died. Yeah. Yeah. But a conversation that I thought was going to last about five minutes would still be going if I didn't cut it off. Okay. There's <laughs> Mike and he could talk. And then uh, my my ex-wife was doing an Under Armour contract with him when he was at Texas Tech. And he she went in to meet with him and he says uh, and she had to write a number down and he wrote it down on his skull can. I remember she told <laughs> me. <laughs> I don't know, you know, he's, he's a little bit eccentric to say the least, but he's a he's a hell of a ball coach. He's oh, yeah. really made a, a name for himself in his own niche, you know, his four wide receiver, you know, uh, uh, shotgun, red gun. I don't know what they call it, but uh, he's made a name. And he's not like all the other play calls. You know, I had this big sheet because I can't see, right? This big right. sheet with all the plays on. He got this little tiny thing he just peeks out like this. He's a, <laughs> I don't need that many plays, you know. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, he does it his own way, but it, it is interesting. And it, it sure gets the press curious. I know that. So. Absolutely. Well, Coach, my last question for you is this. I believe it was in the last segment you talked about the Michigan and South Carolina game. Talk about what was going through your mind when Jadavion Clowney made uh -huh. that huge hit. You, I mean, that you had to be What was like, going through my mind? Yes. Did he die? I wanted to kill our tight end because uh, it was <laughs> – there's a million stories out there, guys. But there's always a backstory to things right. like that. Right. But you see this play, and I it, I still every so often see it on ESPN, and I cringe, okay? But the backstory to that is that it was a busted assignment, okay? Right. Uh, our tight end thought that the tackle – 
had called Trey. Trey meaning I'm going to double team with you. Okay, the tackle actually called Deuce. Deuce means I'm going to double team with the guard. So he thought, the tight end, thought that the tackle was going to step with him and protect his inside because he didn't hear the call. Okay. Clowney went into the gap. They brought the corner off the edge. Okay. And Clowney went into the C gap and our tight end thinking that it was protected. It was not. So Clowney right. had a dead shot to, uh, to Vincent Smith and he knocked him silly. Okay. And won the MVP of the game on that play. Although other than that, Clowney didn't do much in the game because right. the Lawan did a very nice job of blocking him. But because of that play, because it was a turnover and all that, but, and I'm not taking anything away from Clowney, but I kind of am because we kind of, we gave him a free shot at our tailback and right. it cost him a turnover and it was very painful. But there was, there's all kinds of stories that people just don't know about. You know what I mean? I, I got, I got death threats from LSU because we post and cut uh, Dorsey. Remember Dorsey? They're, uh, yeah. Their defensive line. Well, that's another great story. You know, they're saying we tried to post and chop him and hurt him. Well, we weren't trying to hurt him. I had a freshman tackle and a freshman guard. And we had a call where we would call quick rip, which meant we wanted to cut you, or just rip, which meant we were staying up high. Right? Well, one guy got quick rip and one guy didn't. Right? So one guy stayed up and the other guy went down. And they cut him and he got hurt. But if you look at it on the video, you say, oh, my God, these guys are playing dirty. They're trying to hurt our best player, first round draft pick. The LSU fans wanted to kill me, you know. I was getting bad. Man. But that's the back, the back story. We were trying to hurt him at all. They just miscommunicated what the call, the huddle call was, and it looked really bad. Right. So yeah. uh, that's, you know, there's always something that people just don't really know. They see something and they – there's a backstory to every play, you know, uh, and and you have to kind of be involved in it to really know that story and why it happened. And I talk about some of those in the book, you know, yeah. or some things that that the fans saw. I, I tell them there's a hell of a lot more going on out there than you see. Oh yeah, you see something, but there's something else that happened that you don't have any idea it happened. And sometimes I watch it a game. I'm not sure why it happened until I get those guys on the sideline and start yelling at them, you know. Yes. So uh, uh, that's the interesting part of football is, uh, yep, you got a plan, but the plan doesn't always go exactly the way you expect, and there's reasons for it. Sometimes the result's good, and sometimes the result's not so good. But uh, there is usually some kind of story involved in things right. like clowny. You know, nobody runs through the middle of the line of scrimmage untouched without somebody making a mistake, right? I don't okay. care if you're Superman. You know, first round draft pick or otherwise, you know, he, he's getting somebody was supposed to touch him. Okay. And there had, so there had to be more to it. So. Coach, this is my last question for you, and we'll let you go. Joe Warhead, when he came down to Mississippi State to coach, he talked about the gas stations in the South. He'd never been to the South, he never coached in the South. And he talked about, you know, when I'm on the recruiting trail up north with Penn State, you know, I would swing into a gas station and maybe get like a bag of chips. He said in the South, I can get one of the best meals I've ever eaten and, and, and get back on the road again. And he said, I gained 30 pounds in the first six months of living here in Mississippi. Talk about that. Uh, was it just a culture shock when you walked in or like, this is oh, one of the best geez. meals I've ever had when you're leaving the shell station. Well, mine wasn't so much the gas stations as the waffle houses. Okay. <laughs> the, I had to adjust to the, uh, and again, it's something I talk about in the book is uh, going into a Waffle House and them asking you if you want hash browns or grits, right? Right. Well, I have no exposure to grits and I could never figure out how to make them taste good. So I'm going for hash browns, right? And then they say, well, what do you want in your hash browns? I go, you can get something in your hash browns? <laughs> I never heard of that. <laughs> So, and then the tea, you know, they, you want sweet tea? I go, well, are you going to put the sweet and low in for me? I said, no, no, no. We actually have tea that's already <laughs> sweet, you know? So I, there were so many uh, 
that's just another like I say, I was Vinny Gambini. I didn't know any of this right. stuff. Remember, when, remember Vinny Gambini got the grits and wondered what the hell they were, right? That yes. was me. I didn't know. Now, I knew there were grits, but I never ate grits. I never ordered grits. I didn't re really never even seen them, you know. So uh <laughs> when you're not from the south, there's an adjustment. And just like oh, anybody, yeah. somebody going to the south, going to the north is gonna be an adjustment. Oh, yeah. But the south has things they do their own way. OK, and I'm going to tell you something. If you're not from the South, they're going to figure it out real fast. OK, <laughs> they're going to know this dude is not from Tuscaloosa, Alabama. I promise you that. I mean, so uh, that was my transitional growing pains. And it wasn't so much gas stations as it was the Waffle House or barbecue. God, dog, every every meal was barbecue. I got yeah. so tired of barbecue. I get, yeah, we we bring the recruits in. What do we do? Barbecue. Oh, God, barbecue. <laughs> well, I ask you this: What do you miss from the South the most? Oh, the fans! The fans. That ain't. That's easy. The right. The best. The yes. best. I there's nothing like that. No, I Auburn fans are unbelievable, but Alabama fans. It really. They're the same guys. They just pull for another team. Same thinking. You know, the the nuts. They're out of their mind. That the fans were the best. It's just. And nothing like it, guys. You gotta. You guys have been in the South your whole life. You, it's just been your way. You know. You don't oh, know yeah. anything, but those all those ninety thousand whack jobs up there. Who, you know, if you don't win, their 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 week sucks. Okay. Oh yeah. It sucks. They don't. They're, they're, that water cooler talk is. It ain't good. You know. They, some of them can't wait to get on Fine Bomb and complain about it. And. <laughs> uh, and that, you know that's kind of everywhere, but it just seems like it's another level oh, yeah. summer, you know so that's that was an easy answer easy question to answer right yes well coach look man we really have enjoyed talking with you and please do us a favor and come back very soon oh yeah guys i want to come back when the book's done we should yes, have the book should be out in august and i just want to come because I, I i'm learning you got to market these things if you want to sell them Oh, yeah. Writing is just the beginning, you know, and there's guys yeah. like you that could help that along oh, yeah. the way. So I'm going to, I hope we get another opportunity and we've just scratched the surface of stories and we can, you know, talk a little bit more about the book. So, yes, sir. Well, wonderful. Well, uh, we really want to thank you for your time coach and have a wonderful summer and we will see you uh, around the time that the book comes out. Wonderful. Thanks guys. Yes. It's great talking to you. Thank you. Thanks coach. Appreciate right. it. Take it easy. All right. All right. Well, Heath, that was fantastic. Yeah, he even called me old and it didn't offend me. Yes. <laughs> well, let's look at the things we covered. <clears throat> we covered fans, the Tampa Bay Bandits, Spurrier Stories, Golf, yes. UCLA, James Kahn, Celebrities, Gas Stations. I mean, we, we kind of went all over the Waffle place. Waffle Houses? Yeah, Waffle Houses, uh, Grits, Hash Browns. I my mean, we, Cousin we, we, Vinny. Yeah, well, my Cousin Vinny came up multiple times. Yes. You know, he, 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 he I want to say he brought that up like three or four times. So right. phenomenal interview, great interview with Coach Borges. Um, you know, I remember when he was at Auburn. Oh, yeah. We talked about that. Um, but he did an outstanding job uh, when he was in the SEC. He's done an outstanding job his whole career. That's why he's had – such a long uh, career, but yes, uh, I absolutely, we could talk to him every show. We would learn something new. Oh yeah. Well guys, that's going to do it for this edition of the stingray show. We really hope that you guys have enjoyed it and remember to catch us next Thursday, right here on the stingray show on Tide 100.9, when we are going to talk a little bit more of current stuff we're actually going to talk a little sec baseball that and a whole lot more the next time we see you until then have a great rest of your weekend great week next week and we will see you guys on down the road the dogs and stingray are coming for you <laughs> this is Stephen Ray, a.k.a. Stingray, coming to you live from Tuscaloosa, Alabama. I'm Heath Hopkins. I'm here in DeSoto County, Mississippi, right outside of Memphis, Tennessee. I own 
don't know if you want me to get mad. I don't know if you want me to get mean. I don't know if you want me to get rowdy. But that's what I'm about to do. Worst defense ever. We are Mississippi State. Fear the Bills. How many chicken wings you eat in a city? And you just look, ballpark it. Four. What? Four chicken wings, my Here we go, guys. Dobbs, back to pass. Launching the ball. Jimmy, he's got it. Jimmy, he's got it. Touchdown, Tennessee. They shot the dogs in Sanford Stadium. Are you kidding me? My God almighty. What an epic way for the Tennessee-Georgia rivalry to end this game. What a play. Wow. And Heath, any final thoughts before we sign off here on the Tide 100.9? It is great to be on with all the great folks in Tuscaloosa. And hey, if you don't like it, you better learn to love it because this is going to be the best show going today, baby.